Hey, Commodore and Amiga fans. Uh, this is Daniel K. This is Ken Turcott. Hello. And uh, we're just super excited that, uh, that there's such a following of uh, Commodore and the Amiga and all that. We're two guys from the original Toaster team um, way back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, uh, we were asked to maybe say a few things about how much how that experience was for us. Um, for, for me, Ken's on the, on the technical side. I spent a lot of time working on the user interfaces of all the Toaster products, um, uh, Lightwave, paint system and all that kind of stuff. I spent a lot of time in Hollywood. And so I want to just give a special shout out um, about the passing of Ron Thornton, who is the, the lead of uh, Babylon 5, who's a guy I worked with a lot. And, it, and he helped propel the video toaster into a really a lot of heights. Um, and uh, so we were sorry to lose him. Um, but I'll tell you, we just had amazing memories of that. And it just feels really good to hear that there's so many fans out there of the platform. Um, we just had a great time. Ken, you got any thoughts? Yeah, it, it was probably uh, one of the most intense times of my life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, there wasn't uh, a lot of sleep, was there? Kind of moved to Kansas and spent a few years there just really digging into that uh, development project. And yeah. uh, it was yeah. amazing, a lot of fun. Well, I think part, part of it, too, was uh, we, we really felt like we got to change a little bit, a little corner of television, and uh, bring it really the creation of it to the masses. I mean, there was uh, so many people that I, that I remember working with who started off like in their, like basically in their bedrooms at night just trying to craft visual effects um, and then ended up being like a, an effects supervisor on Sequest or, you know, working on Unsolved Mysteries or all these great shows that we were part of. Yeah. And the other thing I thought was pretty fun. Or local cameraman oh, yeah. ended up going on and working uh, on Sequest. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we had, we had just tons of fun sort of raising the art at the same time of letting People work with television, um, work with this amazing computer that was not all that expensive compared to, to, to all the stuff out there that people were used to using. And one of my other favorite stories is that one day this, uh, this really great guy comes up to me and he just says, you're the one, you're, you're the guy. And uh, it was a, a guy named Daniel Lengois. And he is the, uh, or was the CEO of a company called Soft Image, very, very expensive software for doing 3D visual effects. And what he meant to say was, you're the one who stole all of our business from us because you guys gave a bunch of video toasters to Hollywood and they were charging $100,000 per seat before we came in and gave toaster farms to all these folks out there. So we, we really, and, and he laughed about it at that point, but it's fun to be a disruptor. And what I would say to all the uh, Commodore fans out there, all the Mega fans, is when you're involved in something like that, in these great platforms, you're really a disruptor. Because you're, you're one of the people out there who's sort of changing things, making it more accessible, um, really allowing people to do stuff that they couldn't do before, so. Ken was mentioning that, uh, that well, I don't know. I'll, I'll word it a different way. Was it a high-pressure uh, environment to work in? Did you have a deadline to meet like every week? Like yeah, the TV we, show yeah, people we say, ship, you have to meet. But, but, but we were ship in a year. It was, it was it took a three. lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. we, we we worked seven days a week. We you know quite often we would go like five or six days without sleeping. Oh, oh yeah. It wow. Was, uh, Especially it, before trade shows. Really you know when we would uh, go through and show the video toaster and. Uh, especially the first few times, people were, were really excited, and they got us more excited. And we uh -huh. to finish it. And it, I it was. Really I think a lot the, of fun. the most exciting thing for me was the fact that these people out there were creating some amazing visuals um, with this with this device that wasn't really all that expensive. But we'd see the things that they did, and then and Ron's just talking about the, the all the Hollywood stuff. I mean, we, at one point we were doing, we were in like about 16 to 20 sci-fi shows, commercial shows and all that, all at one time, all these things going on. But the stuff that really got us was these, were these people who were um, just small creators and all that, who were making amazing things, who were doing things with 3D that we hadn't seen before. So that was the driving force. It was all of these great customers out there, yep. users. Um, in the Jason Michael Straczynski books, I believe there, there was one person, oh, I forget who was the, 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 the producer, the director, of, I don't know, photography or whatever. And he mentioned that the Amigas that were being used were Amiga, Amiga 2000s with maybe 68030 boards in them with only 32 megs of RAM. Is that true? Is that? Uh, yeah, we, we stacked those on top of each other <laughs> in, in giant, giant racks and had a ton of them uh, so, in there for these render farms. So, so I remember uh, yeah. uh, Todd Rungan rendered a, a video that yeah. was uh, Change Myself. Right. I uh -huh. spent uh, about, well, it was about a week uh, 
here uh, with him in uh, Sausalito, uh, setting up this farm of uh, Amigas to render that video. And uh, we were you know, having some technical issues getting the video onto a laser disc recorder, but it was you know, really fun because it was a, a really good result. And you know, we really kind of felt like you know, this is the first time we were doing this with really low cost uh, equipment, so it was yeah, fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it, everyone felt like like they were breaking new ground. I mean, people like, like, like Todd, um, all the guys that were, you know, like, for example, for example, when we uh, set up to do Bell on Five, um, there was, they were not going to do this show. This was a small production company. Um, Ron, had, Ron Thornton had basically said, look, we can do this. We can every every week. You know, we're going to be able to put out in like a movie, right? Because there were competition with Star Trek, right? And, and the Star Trek folks were still doing traditional models right. at that point. Space Nine. And I remember, yeah. Well, and, and well, and, and, and one of the things that was interesting about that was that you know, I went and spent a lot of time on the Star Trek set too. It was very difficult to get those guys to do anything, you know, uh, digital. Huh. I um, did not know that. But but they. <laughs> and the funny thing about it though is that. We got the job from with Warner Brothers because we showed up, and this was really hard work, we showed up with a shot that was, um, it started off where way, way back, right. you'd see the ship, and then you would basically fly up to from miles away in space all the way to the bridge with people walking around. Okay, so in Star Trek world, ILM would have to do that shot, and it'd be a hundred grand to do that shot. <laughs> they were not doing that every week, okay? But in but what Warner Brothers got convinced by was we were saying, we'll do that kind of stuff, that quality, that level with the video toaster, we'll do that every every week for, for every single show. And so we th that's how they got the job, was the, the visual effects, the visual, the vision that Ron Thornton had, really. How, would lo how long would it take you to like render a three second shot? Oh, uh, well, with our with our render farms, yeah. with all of them, not too long. It, oh. it, it really, I mean, it, it was, it was um, oh, you know, in order to do an episode like they were doing it episodically, okay, and they were running the stuff through every week, we're talking, <laughs> we're really talking about, um, uh, let's see, I don't, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was really only hours, you know, oh, for okay. single shots. It was not because we had so many machines thrown. Oh, at very it. good, very good. It I thought it would really, like take days and days yeah, to well, render. Well, for the whole for all the shots they did because it was it was really effects heavy. But again, that's why the the, the Amiga sort of beat out their their giant uh, silicon graphics machines is because they were able to do so much more with them with these render farms and with the with the toaster also the creative process was a lot easier for these artists and they could find artists from the community who, would, who are so great at it you know that that, that, that it up the level of the whole thing uh, by doing that so um, the, uh, there's a great story about I was on the Star Trek set and I, I asked one of the guys well, what, what are those big rolls up there these giant rolls with dots on them and what are, the, what are these rolls that I'm seeing up there right outside the windows of the set? And the guy said, well, here's, how, here's what happens. Every single time we um, have to show a shot out the window on Star Trek, uh -huh. every single right. time, oh, yeah. what you have to do is we need stars out there, right? So they have these giant rolls to do it. The problem is, is that they can't go very fast because they're deadly. If they're spinning really fast, the ship's like in warp speed, no way. People are going to take people out. So what they do is they would have an excuse in the script to slow the ship down. They'd roll these things up, right? And so they would roll around and they'd just put a spotlight on them and that would be their stars. And the funny story about that for us was, so Ron Thornton is doing all this stuff with CGI. It would cost them $25,000 a shot if ILM did it. The Star Trek side. So they basically said, nope, we're going to use the old fashioned rollers to do this so they'd save money. But again, they had to show, slow the ship down. So there's a lot of stories like that with um, uh, with people using this little, you know, few thousand dollar device to make these movies and television shows. It's just a ton of, <laughs> ton of things. Like that. I, I have a question. Okay, uh, my timeline is wrong, but when did, okay, I know Foundation Imaging was the name of Ron Thornton's company, right? Right. So when did Foundation, I mean, Afterwards, after Babylon 5, I didn't hear much about Foundation yeah. Imaging afterwards. Right. What happened? Yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure either because we, we sort of lost track of the guys okay. over there. What happens also, but that's also a Hollywood thing oh, because okay. these production companies come together. There's a you know few people involved. They jump over here. They jump over there. I mean, they were, they were switching effects supervisors and everything. I think the constant in a lot of that is that the, uh, uh, the, the toaster farms actually did really well and survived and went from place to place and, and uh, were used on lots of different things. And, and when we're talking about toaster farm, we're talking about dozens and dozens of machines or yeah. how many machines in like oh, no, a toaster these, farm? These were, these were dozens of machines. Dozens of machines. Yeah. 
Yeah. When they were doing the build, the problem was that the effects were too good, and so the directors wanted more and more uh, effect shots. Look, <laughs> look at an, look at an episode of Batman Five or even Unsolved Mysteries, some of those shows, um, and you'll see much much heavier usage of CGI. And I I, I think really um, they're not just our company, but the companies at the time that were doing CGI like that that was so popular. Uh, it added such a visual depth to it that that brought the whole the whole industry up. So I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but. Uh, uh, for the camera, I suppose I, I should mention it again. Um, so, so uh, supposedly, you know, Warner Brothers or uh, uh, Babylon Five would tell you guys, uh, "We need this effect shot. Can you improve this in the in the video toaster? Can you improve this in the lightweight right. product?" Yep. And you would immediately yep. put those into into place, right? Yeah, yep. every time. And um, the, so we can, got a lot out of this. Can you give an example of like uh, some yeah, advice hair. they give you? Hair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, Alan Hastings is the senior programmer on uh, on Lightwave. Okay. And, uh, I did I did um, interface design on that on that product as well as the, the, the rest of the toaster, um, and um, he's just he was just really fanatical about that software, even though it was part of the toaster and inexpensive and all that, competing with the biggest brands out there. And so when we heard about something that was needed, and we said we're doing a shot for this, I mean, you know, the, t the whole team really would toil to to get that stuff done. That was what we. Got got out of those relationships. We never made any money off of the off of the Hollywood side other than the fact that we got a lot of benefit back out of you know um, the, the quality of the facts and everything that improved with these great artists using our technology. Uh, uh, and that's one of the things by the way I mentioned Daniel Langlois, he was so mad about because we were giving away for free and he was charging a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, Daniel again just so I can yeah. figure out my timeline, when did you come into the company? When did you come into uh, New Tech or it was about the same time I was in late yeah, 80s. It was, uh, yeah, late 80s. Before the, well, well, well before the toaster shift. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a little company uh, in in, uh, in California doing doing a, a visual effects product, and Paul Montgomery, who is the really, you know, Paul Montgomery and Tim Jennison, you know, were the Tim absolute um, and the core uh, uh, of this technology, and you know, both of them just just brilliant, and and I think that um, uh, what they saw in, in what I was doing, I think, that they saw with Ken is that we're just kind of in our own worlds, we're sort of different. You know, Ken is a hardware engineer, also a software engineer, and all that. And I was, was a conceptual designer, visual artist, um, and you know, making technology that, that helped people create art. And the toaster needed these kinds of things. It needed heavy engineering, you know, it needed really, really heavy art as well. And so we, you know, we sort of brought those to the, to the table. And when did you leave the company, guys? Uh, February 20th or 24th? Yeah. I think that yeah. was Jeez, was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we uh, uh, about, about six of us uh, decided we needed to strike out for California and start a company out there. And so we've been, we've been creating cool stuff, I think, ever, ever and since. And that became, trying to. Wait, so the six of you, is that, that became Play Incorporated? Yeah. Ah, okay. And so did, Kiki Stockheimer uh, follow yeah. you over with she's play? One, she's one of the, the, the sets. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we um, we had a great time, um, really, really great time on the toaster side. And it was just, a, it was a good, it was school basically for all of us, right? It started us all off on So our group. So what is your opinion? CBM died in, in May <laughs> of uh, 1994. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> the video toaster, <laughs> I mean, that was the business for New Tech. I mean, they depended yeah. on the Amiga. And the video toaster to to, to be right. put into it. Right. So, and you left the company in what February. So, what was your opinion after you heard that CBM was gone? And that well, we started, you know, we started working on other on other things and other platforms uh, uh -huh. after that point. But you know, I mean, for a lot of us, for me, the Amiga was my first real computer. You know, I mean, I had done stuff before with for me, little boards and all 64. that. You know, and, <laughs> yeah, and so and so I. You know, we had this sort of in our blood and everything. Even when we went over and, had, and, and Amiga was, was no longer a part, you know, Commodore was, was gone. If you look at the parks we did at Play, you look at Gizmo's 98, for instance, which was basically, we, you know, Paul McCarthy has a famous statement on that. Yeah. Where he basically said, well, being from moved, the Amiga is like being from the future. Being from the Amiga is, being, is, is like being from the future. Um, <laughs> and, and he also said, well, we're in a new home, but it's a fixer upper. And so we ended up doing all, you know, all these products to try to, you know, 
unfortunately try to turn the PC into something that resembled to us an Amiga. That was a pretty yeah. hard task because that was a soulless beast. Oh. <laughs> the PC. But the but we what we always loved was and you see this in all the work even to today um, is it's about awesome demos. It's about people being creative. It's about you know creating something that people really really go. There's you know there's just so much in that. And uh, you know, I think that the spirit of that really started with all the Commodore 64 folks, all the people you know in, these, in the early computing who loved the demo, who wanted to show people everything that they're doing. I mean, that's that's where all the magic was. And so we, uh, we're still trying to to bring that to the <laughs> to the world. So very good. Yeah. So talk about uh, Rocket Life a little bit, and we'll end your, okay, your quick so interview. Okay. Great. Here. Great. So so um, if you want to see kind of what we're doing now, okay. come to RocketLife.com. Um, this is uh, uh, a great venture for us. We're we're a, a company Company with artists, engineers, designers. I mean, it's in the spirit of uh, um, you know new tech and play and all of that um, from the past. And we're doing um, new kinds of visual effects and consumer products. Um, we're doing we're doing cool stuff with LEDs. We're making a neat social platform to let people collaborate and do things together. We're, we even made a game. Um, one of our one of our folks um, is uh, from uh, the EA days. Was making games uh, back in the 80s. And we decided to do uh, a game called uh, Mushroom Mayhem uh, for iOS, which is oh, just super fun. It's, it's it's kind of like a yeah. Well, that's you know, there's iOS is so unfortunately you know, that's Android. How about Android? Android. Android. Exist now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, but but I mean, I think I think the point there is that we're still bringing that stuff forward because that game is kind of like Galaga, you know, right. or uh, if correctly said Gal uh, Galaga, um, <laughs> and Centipede and all that stuff. And so we're still trying to bring a little bit of that magic to these new platforms, which again really could use us all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, thanks very thanks, much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.